let's get to the interview. I've talked long enough and some of you are probably like, wrap it up. We want to hear what John has to say. So here's John Kiriakou. John, like I said, a dear friend, a colleague. He was imprisoned. Uh, he exposed to torture. He spoke out against Bush administration torture, said it was waterboarding. He was prosecuted under the Espionage Act under Obama. He uh, was in prison for 30 months. He got out of prison. He developed into a voice against prison injustices, a voice uh, on the Espionage Act through his experiences, a voice that stands in solidarity with, with, with whistleblowers, and a voice that has been outspoken in support of Assange. And so uh, listen to our interview, enjoy it. Uh, there's a little bit of a glitch. The video, it looks like there's some kind of glitch happening in the matrix, but the audio is fairly clean. And I think you're going to appreciate our conversation. Once again, thank you for tuning in to the Unauthorized Disclosure podcast. And I will be back next week with Rania, I hope. But until then, take care of yourselves. Enjoy the interview. And uh, it's really good to be speaking with you. And there's a lot to get to, but you know, first, let's. Yeah. Uh, toward the end of the show, we'll get to Julian Assange's appeal hearing that is coming next week. Of course, right now, uh, activists, press freedom advocates, are involved in counting down to what they call Day X because they believe that this will be Assange's last best hope. Uh, before the appeals court. Uh, but first, we had what was, I think, maybe most one of the most significant leak prosecutions under President Joe Biden. It mm -hmm. took place, or, or the sentencing for this case took place at the end of January, on January 29th. It involved Charles Littlejohn. Uh, he's an IRS whistleblower. And he's the one who disclosed the documents, the, the tax returns from Trump to the New York Times. Mm. Uh, so here's Charles Littlejohn, the IRS whistleblower, and this was him at sentencing. And so I'd like to ask you in particular, um, as, as somebody who went through uh, a leak prosecution, about this aspect of what happened, because he got an extraordinarily harsh sentence. Wow. Yeah, he did. He got yes, he did. Something close to, I believe, uh, I think he actually got five years in prison. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm just going to read this from, you know, from what I wrote up and, and just have you share your reaction to all of this, because I thought that it was remarkable how the prosecutors were so zealous in going after him. They basically said that uh, similar cases like his inadequately accounted for the seriousness of ideologically motivated leaks. They mentioned an IRS analyst named John Fry who had leaked to, uh, 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 who had a, a uh, who had been associated with um, leaking to prominent attorney Michael Cohen. Um, and then uh, an employee of the U.S. Department of the Treasury of Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, Natalie Mayflower, Sour Edwards. You know, she was someone who released these FinCEN files. Um, for them, basically, the government said those cases were too short, uh, so you should be more harsh. That was the request to the judge. And then looked to Espionage Act cases to say to the court that you should consider a recent case, an employee of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Henry Friese, was sentenced to 30 months in prison after pleading guilty to communicating top secret sensitive compartmented information, primarily over the telephone to two reporters. Um, and I believe in there, there might've been a mention of Reality Winners case and, and other people who had much longer sentences so don't give him what you normally would for re leaking tax documents to that, that violated the privacy of those taxpayers. Treat him like he compromised national security information. It's outrageous. 
there are so many things wrong with this uh, sentence. First of all, the information was embraced by the Biden campaign. The Biden campaign used uh, the information taken from the New York Times, which uh, which Little John had provided uh, to to campaign against uh, Donald Trump. The information was not classified. It was protected but it was not classified. And even if you don't consider him to be a whistleblower, um, the information, the, uh, sorry, the, the sentence was, was so harsh as to put him on par with what Reality Winner got in her whistleblowing case, which we all complained was too harsh. It's like sentences have, have gone crazy in this country. Um, already, we're known among industrialized countries for the, for the harshness of our, of our sentences on a myriad of, of crimes, on most crimes compared especially to our Western European um, allies. But five years for leaking unclassified tax documents? It's just stunning. Now, one of my complaints, and I say this all the time, but I think it bears repeating, is this is how these prosecutors get promoted. This is how they end up going to the A-list uh, law firms. This is how they end up uh, uh, basing their congressional campaigns or their campaigns for governor, which they all eventually want to do. Uh, in, in my case, for example, when it came to negotiating a sentence, uh, there, was, there was one uh, assistant U.S. attorney that was just adamant, adamant that I get... Uh, uh, five years in prison. I ended up with 23 months. Uh, and what is she doing now? She's the deputy attorney general for the criminal division. So this is how they make reputations for themselves. It's how they get promoted. It's how they get ahead in their careers. Their job is to get you the longest possible sentence. Now, in this case, I think we have to blame the judge uh, because there was, as you pointed out, there was ample precedent for a sentence of probation or a sentence of, uh, what was it, six months? Yeah. And then to go five years? I'm sorry, there's just simply no justification for something like that. And are you familiar with some of the absolute garbage that was said by this judge? I will just, uh, I'll, I'll bring this up here because mm -hmm. It's rather astounding. So it was very clear that the Biden Justice Department was deciding that they wanted to send a message to others. We know, especially since President Barack Obama's administration, that many of these cases are about making an example mm -hmm. out of individuals. And it have to be because there's so much leaking in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. And so the ones that do get prosecuted are for a political purpose. This judge was saying extraordinary things about Little John, such as, when you target the sitting president of the United States, you're targeting the office. And when you're targeting the office of the president of the United States, you're targeting democracy. You're targeting our constitutional system of government. And she, her, her name is, by the way, Judge Anna Reyes, appointed by Biden. Reyes also said, the fact that he did what he did and he's facing one felony count, I have no words for it. And then went on to say that the actions of whistleblowing committed by Little John compared to the January 6th riots on Capitol Hill, your actions were also a threat to our democracy. And it engenders the same fear that January 6th does. It cannot be open season on our elected officials. It just can't. There was nothing noble or moral about the nature of his offense. You got a pretty good tongue lashing from Leone Brinkema when you were, <laughs> uh, when you were sentenced for your case, but I don't yes. know, does that sound like it surpasses what you had to sit through before you were sentenced officially? Uh, yeah, that surpasses what Judge Brinkham has said to me. It, it's funny that you bring that up because I was actually going to bring it up. Um, Judge Brinkham has said, well, first of all, my, my attorneys had negotiated something called an 11C1C plea. Uh, 11C1C plea is an agreement between the uh, 
Justice Department and the defense attorneys to a guilty plea in exchange for a sentence that is set in stone, right? And the judge can't reject it or can't change it. She can reject it, but she can't change it. Judge Brigham has said that when she was presented with this 11C1C plea, that she had been a federal judge since 1986 and she had never seen an 11C1C plea. And she said, I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. If I could give you 10 years, Mr. Kiriakou, I would give you 10 years. Well, the truth is she could give me 10 years. All she had to do was reject the 11C1C. But every national security journalist in Washington was in the courtroom that day for my sentencing. And she was playing to the to the reporters. Um, with that said, she never accused me of weakening our democracy. She never accused me of domestic terrorism. So yeah, this is worse. And it's also disingenuous. You know, I, I don't care if this was a Biden appointee or a Trump appointee or from any other president, this judge made herself look silly with a dumb statement like that. And as we made clear here, this is tax returns yes. published by the New York Times, along with other tax files on Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and other very good tax dodgers. Like they're sophisticated. They've been able to get away with paying small amounts of money to mm -hmm. the IRS. If you or I tried to do it, we would be audited or we would probably find an IRS agent knocking on our door. Yeah. And uh, yet she's equating the publishing of this information or the leaking of this information, which is in the public interest to rioting on Capitol Hill, like going through and smashing windows and threatening to string up Mike Pence or Nancy Pelosi. I, come on, give us a break. <laughs> yeah, this is really over the top. You know, I, I felt so sorry, like you did. I felt so sorry when Reality Winner got what was it? Five years and four months. It was just outrageous. Yeah. Um, but to equate this with a national security crime, to equate the release of tax information with with top secret, sensitive, compartmented information, it's just a it's it it doesn't make any sense to me at all. Unless maybe it's in the national security interests of the U.S. to protect the one percent from having us, you know, see how much. That's they right. don't pay when they're expected to pay their taxes. That's uh, right. And so, okay, that brings us to the elites of this country. Uh, and before we move on to other cases that are all basically all in one universe, so I'm putting them off for the end of our conversation. Let's get to that bizarre report from the special counsel about Joe Biden, President Joe Biden's mishandling of classified documents, because this to me was a rather wacky document that got thrown out there for yes. everyone. Uh, and so here's this is the box or one of the boxes that was circled. It's in this garage. It said that there's classified Afghanistan documents that the FBI found in 2022 when they went and searched his home in Delaware. And in particular, I want to I want to raise this uh, because you know you went through your own prosecution, so mm -hmm. I, I imagine that you read a document like this, it might make you feel a little bit infuriated because you sat through lectures about how classified information has to be protected. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they made it seem like it was essential that these kinds of criminal prosecutions take place. And right. you know, a prosecutor could never show discretion. So what I have up on your here on the screen is I actually have these inverted. This isn't exactly the order in the document, but I'll read it like this. The practice of retaining classified material in unsecured locations and, re and, and reading classified material to one's ghostwriter present serious risks to national security, given the vulnerability of extraordinarily sensitive information to loss or compromise to America's adversaries. The department routinely highlights such risks when pursuing classified mishandling prosecutions, but addressing those risks through criminal charges the only means available to this office 
is not the proper remedy here. In reaching our decision, we did not consider every circumstance in which criminal charges against a former president or vice president for mishandling classified information may be warranted. But on the facts of the case, and this is from the Department of Justice principles on there. I never knew that this was a language that was on the Justice Department site, but apparently they use this phrase. The facts of this case, the fundamental interests of society, the fundamental interests of society do not require criminal charges against Mr. Biden. And for this additional reason, yada, 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 we're declining prosecution. So, so yeah, there it is. It's not in the fundamental interests of society to prosecute Joe Biden. You know, I wrote an op-ed uh, in Consortium News. I'm going to say it's almost two years ago now. Whenever, whenever Donald Trump was initially um, caught with the uh, classified documents at Mar-a-Lago, and uh, the op-ed was headlined "Don't Charge Donald Trump with Espionage," and the subheadline was "And Don't Charge Anyone Else Either." Uh, we need to come up with something akin to what we had in the 1990s when classified information was mishandled or allegedly mishandled. And I'll, I'll recount a, a story that I've told you in the past. At the CIA in the 1990s, I sat next to a woman who was having an affair with a man who used to be a senior CIA officer. He had retired and he had gone to CNN as a uh, terrorism consultant. And in the course of pillow talk, she relayed classified information to him. He went on CNN and repeated the classified information. The CIA began an investigation. They immediately tied it right back to her. She was not charged with espionage. What they did was they wrote a strongly worded letter and put it in her personnel file. They suspended her without pay for two weeks, and she was ineligible for a promotion for a period of one year. That's how you handle the misuse of classified information. Now, you saw the picture. You, you just posted the picture of the box in Joe Biden's garage. Who had access to that information? Who, who saw the information? Who was the information revealed to? Nobody. Maybe it went to his ghost writer. Okay, shame on you. You should have a strongly worded letter put in your personnel file. But espionage? Sorry. Same with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has a problem. He has lots of problems. But in this case, he had a problem with, with taking classified information uh, uh, with him in his retirement. Did he publish it? Did he turn it over to Fox News? Is society a more dangerous place because of it? No, not that anybody has proven. And so, you know, let's put a strongly worded letter in his personnel file or something. But to charge him with espionage, which in some cases can be a death penalty case? No, I'm sorry. It's not appropriate. We need to revamp the whole thing. You and I have talked about this at length, both privately and, uh, and you know, on your podcast and on my radio show. The, the Espionage Act needs to be scrapped and rewritten so that it targets people who mean harm to our country, people who are working on behalf of foreign governments or foreign entities or dangerous terrorist groups or something like that, not for some absent-minded politician who leaves boxes in his garage. Sorry. You're absolutely right. Before the people like you and other whistleblowers and other lower level leakers who had their lives destroyed or people who were found to be retaining documents in their homes and mm -hmm. had their homes raided by the FBI, I would just like to, before we move on from Joe Biden, read this part from the special counsel's report. And I just read this to bluntly call out the special counsel and his team for printing bullshit yeah. in this because I have followed Justice Department prosecutions and this is not how others have been prosecuted. So I just want to read this. This says, so 
let me backtrack. We didn't say this. So to make sure that everyone listening understands what Biden was found to have in his possession or found to have done, he had these documents. He apparently took these records that showed that he opposed the troop surge that President Obama wanted for Afghanistan. Admirable. Glad mm -hmm. he opposed it. Then he uh, had these notebooks and he shared them with his ghostwriter. And there are recordings of Joe Biden speaking to his ghostwriter and apparently leaking classified information from these notebooks that had highly sensitive military, national security, other things that had been noted from, I think, presidential daily briefings of meetings of that nature. So this is what the special counsel wrote. For an oral disclosure of information, as opposed to the disclosure of a classified document, the government must prove that the possessor has reason to believe the information could be used to the injury of the United States or to the advantage of any foreign nation. Accordingly, to establish that Mr. Biden violated Section 793E, that's in the Espionage Act, when he read the information from his notebooks to his ghostwriter, we would need to prove that he acted with an intent to violate the law and had reason to believe the information he disclosed could be used to harm the United States or benefit a foreign nation. Um, so, like, that's not how people are prosecuted. No, it's not. It's not. And you know, you know as well as I do, Kevin, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but in, in my case, a precedent was set when Judge Lena Brinkema said that she would not respect the precedent that had been set in the Tom Drake case, that that the, the defendant had to have criminal intent to leak the document. She said, Mr. Kiriakou, you either did it or you didn't do it, and I think you did it. And my attorney stood up and said, Your Honor, are you saying that a person can accidentally commit espionage? And she said, that is exactly what I'm saying. Right. So this whole thing of intent to violate the law, well, when you talk to your ghostwriter, you were violating the law and your intent to share that information with your ghostwriter is your viol like that is, no, that is the there intent. Is no, like, but also to me, that also <laughs> seems to be a very twisted way of, of, of viewing laws. It's like, I didn't mean to kill that person. Therefore, I should not be punished for killing that person because I wasn't really trying to murder them. That doesn't sound like how people get off and get away with crimes in this country or, or, yeah. or just, just don't go to prison. I mean, basically, he's saying since Biden didn't intend to violate the Espionage Act, he can't be prosecuted for violating the espionage act <laughs> but that and then it's saying that if he and then it says had reason to believe the information he disclosed could be used to harm the united states or benefit a foreign nation but again the reason to believe the information would do such a thing it comes from all the meetings you have with people in government that advise you about the sensitivity of that information, correct? Like that's correct. that's how you are on notice that you have to protect the information and not leak it. Absolutely. And then when you're when you're first given a security clearance, you have to sign secrecy agreements saying that you'll never disclose the information that you uh, come across. And then every time you're read into a, a compartment, which uh, which makes up sensitive compartmented information, special compartmented information, you sign new secrecy agreements saying that you're never going to disclose the information. Um, and we all know that, that the, um, that the uh, president's daily brief is the most highly classified uh, publication that comes out of the intelligence community. You can't disclose that stuff. Yeah, and David Petraeus, I think, did something almost similar to Joe Biden. Now, Joe Biden wasn't having an affair with his ghostwriter, but right. Joe, but but David Petraeus shared these notebooks. They called them black books in black the prosecutor. Books. It, yeah, they, yes. and his biographer Paula Broadwell had access to all of these and was referencing them for his mm -hmm. the, the 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 fawning biography that was written 
about him. So anyways, let's move on to the next thing, which is to discuss what happened to Joshua Schulte. The yeah. sentencing he yeah. received, uh, it was over 40 years, or it was about, four, I think it was 40 years. 40, 40 years, yep. 40 years sentence. Uh, now, top, uh, it's treated separately, so let's treat it separately. There were two different trials. Yes, we know that he was accused of having child sexual assault material on his computer and he was convicted of it and he received six to seven years in prison for it. And th that's serious violation. And whatever was happening with that material, it looks ugly. Mm -hmm. That being said, that's not our concern. That's not what you and I deal with. So I'm just going to set that aside the same way the court set it aside. Because if you look at what the prosecution was doing, they reserved their worst and most aggressive prosecution for the leaking that mm -hmm. Joshua Schulte did. He got 33 and a half years, I think, for the disclosure of these materials and in particular right. i want to draw your attention and get your response to the fact that a terrorism enhancement was added to one of the charges I mean, what do you think about that the the computer crime offense was apparently on a list was it added to a list after the patriot act was adopted following the september 11th attacks and mm -hmm. so being on this list the government went in there and decided they were going to ask for this terrorism enhancement. Mm -hmm. And they said that they needed to do this because of the fact that he had, uh, he had tried to retaliate. He had a cal he had, sorry. He, his offense was calculated to influence or affect the conduct of government intimidation or coercion or to retaliate against government conduct. So in particular, he was retaliating against government conduct by releasing the CIA hacking materials to WikiLeaks. So a leak, even though we're talking about a computer crime offense, basically, if they could have, they would have tried to do this to the Espionage Act and made it a terrorism offense. Mm -hmm. They're going after him and saying basically that leaking to WikiLeaks was tantamount to terrorism. Terrorism. Mm -hmm. There are so many things wrong uh, with his sentencing. Um, we should we should give a little bit of background here too. This was the second time that he was tried for these alleged crimes. The first time he was he was acquitted of two charges and the jury hung on all the other charges. And then Josh Schulte did something very, very stupid. He fired his attorneys and elected to represent himself. And uh, by all accounts, uh, he came across to the jury as, as arrogant, uh, which didn't do him any favors. Now, one of the things that I think was a real disservice to him was, was the fact that... Um, there was no evidence, there was no documentary evidence that he had ever downloaded anything from the CIA system and passed it to WikiLeaks. And what the Justice Department said to explain that was that he was such a genius, such a computer genius, that he was able to completely cover his tracks. And the reason why he's guilty is that there is no evidence against him. Now th that doesn't make any sense at all, but apparently there were a lot of nodding heads in the, uh, in the jury box. And so he rejects this label of whistleblower. He says that he never sent WikiLeaks anything. Okay, fine. I call him a whistleblower. You call him a whistleblower. Um, I also want to say something about enhancements. First of all, this terrorism enhancement is just outrageous and there's no recourse. You can't appeal an enhancement. It's just, it's just up to the judge at the request of the prosecution. But what is an enhancement? If you go to the Justice Department's website 
and you look at the sentencing schedule, it looks like an actuarial chart, right? This is, I would really encourage everybody to do this. So you have on the left-hand side, you have levels one through 40 with one being you, you know, jaywalked on federal property, right? And across the top, from, from left to right, there are something like seven columns. Number Column number one is you've never been in trouble in your life. Number seven is you're a career criminal. You commit federal crimes every single day. And the others are in between. So level 47 is the federal death penalty, right? That's the, the most serious level you can be. And then at the other extreme is, you know, they don't even waste their time prosecuting you. Okay. So Josh Schulte had never been in trouble in his life. So they charge him with espionage, which is actually level 27 on, on a, a scale of one to 40. So level 27 calls for something like nine years in prison. How did he get 40? Well, they gave him an enhancement for terrorism. They gave him an enhancement for hacking. They gave him an enhancement for, this is one of my favorite ones, failure to take responsibility. So if you are charged with a crime, you plead not guilty, you go to trial and you're found guilty, they say, well, you were lying when you said you were not guilty. So that means you failed to take responsibility for your criminal behavior. That's an enhancement. So instead of being a level 27, the first enhancement makes it a 29, the second a 31, the third a 33. All of a sudden, that nine years becomes 40 years. That's how they did it. And we should also mention that he was kept in horrendous conditions. Oh, I just wrote the, about this. The special administrative measures, which I imagine to some of some degree will carry over to wherever he's going to be incarcerated. I know correct that the judge said to keep him reasonably close to somewhere in the central part of the United States. I, I, I don't I don't actually know off the top of my head where he's from, but they wanted to move him closer to his family. It's usually yeah. the, good luck with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, how likely is it that he gets put in like Florence, Colorado, you know, the, the, the super Florence. Prison. Yeah. Florence, Marion or Terre Haute. Mark my words. Those are CMU Florence, units. So the communication management units. Yeah. Correct. Um, listen, the, the judge recommending to the justice department that they keep him close to family is like me recommending to the justice department that they keep him close to family. It counts for literally nothing because is, is it is the sole it is the sole responsibility of the Bureau of Prisons to decide who goes where. The judge right. can say all he or she wants that, as my judge did, that I should go to a minimum security work camp. It makes no difference to anybody. And, and this holds with Julian Assange as well. We can talk about that whenever you want. But yeah, uh, for John well, so just, just leading into Assange, I was going to mention mm -hmm. that the terrorism enhancement is certainly something that I would expect his attorneys in people who are advocates for him to now raise in the context of these extradition proceedings. Yes. Because we're talking about the potential for cruel and inhuman treatment. And this computer crime offense is there's, there's very few people who have been prosecuted under the espionage act who have also had this charge affixed to them. It may be kind of stunning. You know, you, you think the justice department is very aggressive so probably there are a lot of these cases, but it's not always that people who have done these leaks have also faced computer crime offenses, even though they could, because mind you, all of this information is being downloaded from computers. That's right. So I'm not Good quite point. sure what's going on at the Justice Department in their National Security Division, but Reality Winner didn't have it. Uh, Daniel Hale did not have it. Terry mm -hmm. Albury did not have it. And I think there's one more recent case that... I thought it was remarkable that they didn't get it. But Julian Assange does, and mm -hmm. Chelsea Manning did. Mm -hmm. And Chelsea Manning didn't get a terrorism enhancement. However, 
the military went after her and said that she had aided the enemy. You might yes, recall. Yes, I do. And, and splashed around this evidence that made it seem like she had helped Al-Qaeda indirectly by leaking to WikiLeaks. And so I fear that this is going to come back to Julian Assange. I fear that through this conspiracy to commit a computer crime that Julian Assange is going to be uh, this won't be in the UK because they want to be careful, but in a US trial in that setting, I fear that the US government is going to have its knives out and ready and will say that Julian Assange aided terrorists. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly what's going to happen. They tried the same thing with Tom Drake, you'll recall, what, 15, 16 years ago now. Um, in fact, Tom tells a really wonderful story. Um, about a proffer meeting that he and his attorneys uh, had with uh, the prosecutors at the Justice Department. And one of the prosecutors said, um, you have the blood of American soldiers on your hands. And he said, whose blood? What soldier? Name one. Name one single soldier. And everybody just went silent. They try this kind of garbage all the time, saying that people have died because of your revelations. There's blood on your hands. Uh, that that you've given aid to, uh, aid and comfort to the enemy and and to terrorist groups. None of it's none of it's true. You you recall probably better than anybody that after uh, the the Chelsea Manning case was completed, the head of NSA at the time came out and said that there was no discernible harm to the national security. None, zero. It, it was embarrassing to see what people say behind closed doors, but there was no harm to the national security. Just like with uh, this this IRS guy, Little John, there's no harm to the national security. They can compare his case to as many DEA or DIA cases as they want. There's no harm. And just like with Julian Assange, there's no harm. Yeah, exactly. And so we've got this hearing coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, on my way to getting your final thoughts for this episode and letting you give some parting words about Julian Assange and the fact that we have this major hearing. I do want to mention that we have news uh, that I haven't had a chance to write up yet talking to you, but I'm going to get something together because I've been closely following this case. The CIA is going to invoke the state secrets privilege in this lawsuit that I thought was rather incredible because the judge did not dismiss it and allowed a, 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 a basically complaint against the CIA to stand that they could go and litigate. Mm -hmm. And it involves, well, I'll let the CIA tell you because here's what I have from the memo they just submitted to the court. After the court's recent decision on the government's motion to dismiss, the sole remaining claim in this case is the plaintiff's allegation that at the CIA's request, the Spanish defendants, we're talking about UC Global, this private security company that targeted Assange, that they illegally downloaded the contents of the plaintiff's electronic devices when they visited Julian Assange at the Ecuadorian embassy in London and transmitted these materials to the CIA. So these are two journalists and two attorneys that have sued, said their privacy rights were violated. The CIA continues, any factual inquiry into these allegations, whether they are true or not, would implicate classified information as it would require the CIA to reveal what intelligence gathering activities it did or did not engage in, among other things. Because the CIA cannot publicly reveal the very facts over which it is seeking authorization, or the very facts over which it is seeking authorization to assert the state secrets privilege. A sentence is written weird. Anyways, <laughs> they um, are going to invoke the state secrets privilege to prevent a judge from holding them accountable for copying people's electronics. I've been talking to um, UBS whistleblower Brad Birkenfeld about this at length over the last uh, week or so. Brad visited Julian on two occasions in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. And Brad, of course, is an American citizen born and raised in the United States. Uh, he turned his cell phone in, uh, just like every visitor to the Ecuadorian embassy did. And now is confident that his information was illegally, improperly downloaded by uh, this Spanish contractor and turned over to the CIA. And there's no recourse. 
This is clearly, obviously, a legal, a constitutional violation, and uh, there's nothing that uh, anybody can do uh, about it. You know, there is a deep state, and you can call it whatever you want. You can call it the deep state. You can call it the state. You can call it the federal bureaucracy. Whatever it is, it tramples the constitutional rights of, uh, of average American citizens, and there's no recourse. This is yet another example. Yeah, they're doing it right now because yeah. as we record this podcast, they're saying to the Congress, you're going to go into closed session and debate 702, yep. reauthorization for uh, surveillance authorities for the NSA. We don't want this to happen out in the, in the open for, for mm -hmm. the public to respond and, and tell us that we need to change how we do all of this. John Codal, the judge, he can accept this or he cannot he actually mm -hmm. could say that you're not allowed to invoke the state secrets privilege but you know what there's very very few judges yeah. that would do that. he Have might he might but i hear he's retiring soon he's he's a much older judge and so if he didn't grant them the state secrets privilege, I fear that the CIA just drags this out and then hopes that the case gets reassigned and then tries to find a way to invoke the state secrets privilege mm -hmm. again later mm -hmm. on down the road. There's always, I mean, they are masters at procedurally gaming the system. As Absolutely. Absolutely they are. And this really makes me fear for the civil liberties of, of all Americans because it looks like they're going to get away with this. And if they get away with it now, they're going to get away with it next time because a precedent will have been set or reset. And then, you know, where do we turn from there? Where do we go? All right. So I'll let you have the last words here. Anything you want to say about the pivotal hearing yeah. that is happening on February 20th and what's at stake and how I think people should understand this is the first chance for Julian Assange and his legal team to go before this court and say that that lower court decision, the district court decision from 2021 must be reconsidered because it was not acknowledged and recognized that Julian Assange has press freedom rights. That's right. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people about this hearing next week. Julian's uh, relatives, uh, his UK attorneys, one of his American attorneys, even people at WikiLeaks, and everybody is pretty certain that he's going to be not just extradited a week from tomorrow, but but whisked directly from the courtroom to a waiting FBI plane and flown immediately back to the United States. If and when that happens, it's up to all the rest of us to stand up. We're going to have to maintain a presence at that courthouse. We have to go to every hearing. We have to stand outside. We have to talk to the media. We have to march. We have to write. We have to, to meet with citizens who need to be educated on this, uh, on this issue uh, because there's a very thin line between Julian and all the rest of us. Julian is obviously a publisher He's obviously a journalist and any conviction, any prosecution would put every national security journalist in America on the firing line. I mean, the Constitution really is what is at stake here. And so if the government is going to try to chip away at the Constitution, it's up to the rest of us to fight them on it. We, we have to we, we can't go down without a fight. We, we owe it to ourselves, if not to Julian. Well, thank you, John. It was really great to be able to speak with you. Thank I'm you, glad Peter. I was able to talk with you about all of these stories and these important issues. And everyone should go read uh, your articles. Um, you have a sub stack and uh, you're also regularly contributing to Consortium News. So, Thank you very much.